Hey there, folks, and welcome to another episode of Crit Hit Interviews. I'm Arlian, and we're here today with Marina Kataka. Hello. And Sean Hantani. Hello. Of Analgesic Productions, whom you may recognize as the developers of Even the Ocean and Anodyne, the latter of which they're currently working on a sequel for. And I believe you also did All Our Asias? Yeah, that was a project that I did last year. Or this, yeah, last year and this year. <laughs> Fair enough. So first of all, I'll just sort of pose this question to the both of you. Just what's your favorite game? Mm. Marina, <laughs> do you have one? I actually saw that question and I was like... Ugh. Yeah, that's a really hard <laughs> question. Um, I think... When it comes to a lot of art and media, like different things are important to me at different times. So yeah, after thinking about it for a while, like definitely some of my old favorites as growing up were like Mega Man X4 and Final Fantasy IX. Um, and then like in college, I was really into The Binding of Isaac. Recently, I really like Butterfly Soup. Um, Wait, butterfly Soup? Yeah, that's a... Uh, visual novel about like queer asian american girls huh yeah it's really good i need to like talk to lovey about that because that sounds up her alley yeah so i don't know kind of different th oh also one thing that is sort of a favorite of mine that sort of like sits in my brain differently than other games is crypt of the necro dancer um, I actually like got a dance pad to play that game, and uh, especially during like I I've been living in a lot of places with pretty like harsh winters and being kind of cooped up at home a lot, and so that game has kind of helped me to like I don't know get some sort of physical activity in, and I think it's a great game and a lot of fun. Canada harsh or like uh... uh so I was living in Maine and now I live in Minnesota which are both sort of near Canada <laughs> yeah and I've 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 heard they can get some comparable chills there yeah. so yeah I also uh, totally appreciate Final Fantasy 9 too cutesy art style aside it was very solid system wise and I like Kuja yeah it's it, my my definitely like things change a lot I think I really liked how cute it was as a as a child. And then more recently, I really enjoyed Final Fantasy X, even though I hated that as a teen. It's very interesting. I don't know. We threw it together, kind of. Though I actually, yeah, I forget that we did that this year. Yeah. We were going to talk about it on like a podcast or something, but then we didn't. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Also, I want to like, I don't know, a lot of sort of early game sort of hobbyist communities surrounding like game maker and the OHR RPGC. I don't know if like a lot of like individual projects super stood out as like my favorite games, but just kind of like being around a bunch of those games was like a really big part of my game playing stuff. So like one of them is like ends of the earth and ends of the earth Two, which are kind of like the, some of the bigger OHR RPGC games, and they're just kind of very straightforward RPGs. But uh, I don't know. Like, it was just a very early instance of, oh, like, I just want to find some game to play. Oh, this one's, like, free. And then, oh, it's part of this whole community of people making games. How about you, Sean? I was taking notes while I uh, was listening to Marina. So, okay, as, like, a child with, like, you know kind of these console games. Uh, I liked the Super Nintendo Kirby's a lot, like Kirby Superstar. That was really interesting. Yes! That had, it's just, it's it's actually like pretty experimental. <laughs> it has many games in one. And then a lot of Game Boy Zeldas, obviously. So the Oracles, Link's Awakening. And then I did play a lot of Guitar Hero, Band Hero, Dance Dance Revolution, rhythm games. <laughs> so those are like kind of my... Triple A influences, I guess. Hmm. But the more interesting, I guess those are interesting too, but like internet games. So I played a lot. Has anyone heard of, um, there's this game developer named Pseudo Lone Wolf. He made like this like Mardek RPG 
Flash game. Wait, Mar- Mar- it was on like uh, Newgrounds, right? Yeah, it had, like safe yeah. states that carried forward. Yes. Yeah, I love that guy's or that person's games. Um, I don't know if they make games anymore, but you know, I played a lot of. They're like kind of these like simple Flash RPGs that were like you know kind of like traditional in a lot of ways, but somehow it was interesting. Um, a lot of cave story as in like middle school, high school. And so those were all kind of influential in different ways. But then going on into college, I played a lot of Dust Force in college while we were making Anodyne. I was really terrible at that game. Yeah, I wasn't that good either. I, I just like barely got to the end and quit. I think the music was more influential for me in terms of that. Um, I'm saying influential games, favorite games. But um, after college, the three or the two I always think about, I like I like Kentucky Route Zero a lot. And I like, games that Aether Interactive are doing, so like Subserial Network or Localhost. Uh, those are pretty fun and interesting, like experimental narrative stuff. And then recently, I like Luca. Have you played Luca? Oh, you interviewed Colin, right? Did interview Colin, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been enjoying that a lot. I was just playing it before this. So yeah, that's kind of like a timeline of different games. They're all like interesting for different reasons. If someone's listening, I would probably recommend playing those games I just mentioned. So Kentucky Route Zero... Subserial Network, Luca, those are really good. It's actually on my list. I just haven't gone to a round to it because I've just been clearing out my Steam list of everything right. one by one. And Luca's really interesting. Like it has a very, very like strong, unique aesthetic and uh, interesting world building that's like accomplished through not just visuals but also this kind of like visual novel poem esque text presentation it's hard to describe <laughs> which becomes more prominent in the new game plus which gives that reason to dive into it. yeah apparently which i i yeah i just got to that oh so. i'm not gonna Curious. say much more um okay <laughs> yeah it's neat yeah it seems interesting wait 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 did, what did, was did you become super dreaded too the first time you went through or no no i um I got through it like 90... Oh, so, wait. Oh, Marina, oh. you played a bit of it, right? You know we're talking about the meter. Yeah, but I didn't know what it does. So. Yeah, I don't know I don't know what it does, so you don't have to... <laughs> oh, don't spoil it. Mine didn't, mine didn't fill up, but I know something happens it when it fills up. It gives you an ending. Ah. Uh, it leads yeah, to a an, an whole ending. And that's all I'll like say. going to happen yeah. to me. <laughs> oh, I mean, it's fine. It happened to me. I, You get an option to just fill it straight up. And I was like... Oh, I got here. All this way over here. And you give me an option. I'm done. I'm done. I, I did, tried so hard to not fill it up. <laughs> I'm at like 90% anyways over here. I'm just done. And then yeah, it gave me like, an ending. And I was like, oh, maybe. Oh. I'm really curious about that. I'll have to check it out. I, I, I ended up uh, kind of digressing, but I like that there's difficulty options. And there's an item that you get later that lets you, the one that lets you heal all your health if you have full pink meter and i kind of just ended up abusing that which was still kind of hard for the final boss but anyways yeah (laughs) it's harder actually in the new game plus because new game plus your dread meter fills up when you get hit oh so you can abuse full healing all you want you still need to be careful about your dread meter oh that's interesting because like i ran so smart i ran a uh a health build basically like Mm -hmm. i because that thing takes not a set amount of charge it just takes all your charge yeah so i stripped out all my charge and had like none which means it filled up really fast but it doesn't help if your dread is going up really fast yeah it not Mm. not so much no but i mean i had health for days (laughs) (laughs) yeah (laughs) i was like (laughs) god damn it he 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 knew oh yeah that's 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 smart yeah the game is really clever so i'm like looking forward to what the second playthrough has uh which i mean actually i think this touched a fair amount because like the next question was like so by the way what games you diving into of late both indie tabletop or otherwise and i mean if you guys have anything you want to add to that list that's i do but i'll let marina talk first okay uh yeah so i did list luca although i haven't gotten that far into it yet um and then i played through (sighs) imperishable memories recently which is a shmup um, that's kind of narratively focused. And uh, yeah, it does some like really cool things. And the I really like the art. It has like 
um, like hand drawn, sort of like marker drawn stuff that looks like it's from like a sort of like a kid's sketchbook um, mixed with like low poly models and different kind of like trippy light patterns. And yeah, it's really cool. I don't play a lot of shmups and I kind of just stumbled my way through certain parts of it whenever it got hard. But there's like a like story modes and stuff so that it doesn't really matter if you die a lot. And yeah, it's a really cool game. Oh, thank goodness it's not Toho hard. <laughs> yeah. Also, I I missed one of the like main mechanics or like didn't quite understand it. So that made it a little harder. But anyway, it's a cool game. Yeah, I want to check that out. I've seen it. Uh, it's because it's the one that has like the Ichio page, correct? And I believe it may also have a. It is page. on Ichio. Yeah. yeah. I saw it. It was like this looks incredibly weird, and like that one like shmup that also sort of has uh, story segments just sort of interspersed throughout, but looks less like it's making fun of the audience. Mm. I can't remember what the other one is called. It was like the very, very meta shmup. Is it indie? Yeah, there's a very. It's an indie shmup that's like very meta, and it's like mm. a shmup interspersed with like segments of people like trashing the game and other things. Oh yeah, I don't know what that is, but it sounds. <laughs> it it's weird. Sounds weird. It is weird. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't heard of that. I've been I've been playing a lot of Resonance of Fate. Have you played that? Um, have you heard of it? It's a PS3 Xbox 360 RPG from like 2010. Oh no! Wait, Resonance of Fate. Yes, I actually yeah, yeah, have yeah. it on PS3. I did, oh, okay. Like the shooter one. Yeah, it's like a. It's um. I think Mar Marina, you played Valkyrie Profile, right? At some point, or is Valkyrie that, Chronicles. Chronicles is the one uh, that's like a war game. Yeah, like I think it's by the same developers. Tries. Uh. Um, the Resident Fate is interesting. It's like the battle system. I won't really try to explain the battle system, but it's um, it's kind of a mix of strategy and action in a really nice way. But outside of that, the world is really interesting because it's entirely set on a tower, and yeah. um. And, like, the themes of the story, you know, there's three main characters, and, like, the first, like, 60% of the game is just, like, character building. And it's kind of, like, slow if you play too many of the side quests, but it's interesting because, like, things happen, like, at this beginning, you, f you, think, you think that the main characters are, like, very poor, but it's actually, like, they're quite well off within the game's world. And there's a lot of, like, different takes on the game's kind of, like, religion and... Because the game had like literal stratification, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It had, it's all the whole world set on a tower, and um, you can't go outside the tower, which is, I think, is an interesting choice. And there's a lot about it that's just interesting to think about. But yeah, I'll just I'll just leave it at that. The battle system is interesting again. It's like I don't know. I, you kind of just have to watch it or play it to really like get it. A combination of like cinematic and strategic. Yeah, like it really rewards aggressive play. And not really defensive play. And it's like, there's two types of damage. So you know how, like, in... I can't think of a metaphor, but, like, enemies have one health bar, but you have to hurt them with one type of damage before you can actually, like, get rid of that damage. Like, set up damage and then using finishers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of like that. Anyway, it's an interesting game. It would be really, really good if it was about, you know, 30% as long. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but they're, I think, just market pressure at that time and point in time they needed to make it like a 50 hour 60 hour game um but uh yeah i don't know i've been enjoying that i sort of want to pick it back up now but then i'll disappear for apparently 50 or 60 hours if you skip the side quests and play really aggressively it goes pretty fast which i learned like halfway through and i was like okay i don't have time i'm just gonna skip the side quests i find it actually really hard to skip side content i know me too <laughs> Yeah, and also sometimes it's harder. Well, because the side content is like grindy and makes you more powerful often. Yeah, and so then you're trying to rush, but then everything just gets harder. Yeah, the the battle system in Residence of Fate works. It works well enough where like if you 
play well, you can actually get pretty far by just customizing a really strong weapon and playing well, which I like. Yeah. But um, maybe I'm going to hit a wall soon. We'll see. Uh, I really was enjoying Valkyria Chronicles. I don't know if it's actually by the same people, but I I was really into it, but then I hit a huge difficulty wall where enemies could just kind of like break the whole rules that you had been playing with up until that point, and I was like, uh, I can't do this at all. Mm, oh yeah, no, I don't think it's the same developer. They just suddenly can like warp and then like hit your weak points all the time. Ugh. Jeez. But it's a cool game though. I would play it if I could cheat, maybe. Or I would have continued playing it at the time. But actually, what I've been playing recently, I played through Mega Man X Legacy Collection 2 recently. That's one of the biggest things. And that was really cool, because I had mostly... I The only one I had played before was X5, I think. So Legacy Collection 2 has Mega Man X5 through 8. And... They mostly have a kind of bad reputation, and they're all like pretty flawed in various different ways. But I actually really liked, I played through all of them, and I really liked a lot of things about all of them. And they're all pretty different from each other, and it was just kind of a fun, a fun time to see these games that I had heard about growing up and been interested in, but also kind of like heard that they were bad. But yeah, I thought they were like pretty, pretty interesting. Especially X7, which people really don't like. And it has these like segments where you're like in 3D and like not side scrolling at all. I don't know. I thought they actually kind of worked in a funny way. The limit of my knowledge for the X series is X2. I, I, I know one of them has a satellite drop, and I played X1 and actually beat it. And I did X2, and other than that, I don't know, because, like, my Super Nintendo was sold on me very young, and then I only had a PlayStation sporadically. Yeah. But, to, I guess, suppose shuffle the uh, conversation slightly, what was it that got you two into game development? You mean, like, uh, like personally? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, first of all, uh, I might hear banging noises, because there's window washers my windows right now um but um uh for me i didn't really i didn't really do that much as a kid i made some like cave story mods that never really got finished um geez. but and then in college i just i was learning how to program in college and i found like an engine and started playing with it and kind of got into it that way so it was mostly through programming and just i was like oh wait i can do this now why not try to make interesting things <laughs> yeah and then for me I kind of mentioned earlier that like my older brother and I would look for like free games to download on the internet and that that kind of led us to different game engines and so I kind of pretty much as long as I can remember have been messing around in like Game Maker and OHRPGCE and then even outside of that we would just kind of like imagine games or like sketch like RPG maps or something in a notebook or whatever. So I don't know. It just kind of felt very natural to me um, being interested in games to want to like engage with the idea of games more. That was something I did a little bit. Oh, geez. <laughs> a little bit with like my sister, like stuff around Animal Crossing or like, Game Boy RPGs. Although we never really got into like making stuff together outside of stuff on paper how was it that you two came to work together so it was a mutual friend someone who went to high school with sean and then went to college with me so they let me know that their friend sean was looking for an artist and i think i emailed sean and then we started working together <laughs> well because i was looking for a, just i was looking for only a pixel artist but then you know the game needed and Dine at the time needed some narrative work, so Marina helped to fill in uh, that need, and it worked out pretty well. Oh, well, really well, I guess. Yeah, right. It's kind of like weird how well it worked out, but um, yeah, that was basically it over email. I don't think we actually met until the game was basically done, right? In real yeah. life. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. Taco Bell. Yeah, Taco Bell. 
how have you come to complement each other's workflow? Working collaboratives, the collaboratively English, please, is a little bit different than working solo. Right. Uh, usually, I think, well, we both make solo games and can make solo games, but I think when we work together, we tend to divvy up a lot of, like, I guess, so, I mean, I always take music and the programming, and then we kind of split the design, and so far in our collaboration, Marina takes the writing lead, because I think it just works better when one person is doing most of the planning, and then, like, sometimes... I might come to like fill in some of the writing if there's like too much of it to do. But for this, we're oh, we can talk about N nine two later. But that's generally like what we've done, I think. Okay. Yeah, and Sean also does a lot of the like business stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, that's been getting like pretty big recently because we have console ports and trademarks. Like I've been filing trademarks. That's Ugh. hiring lawyers. That's Christ. It's oh, God. Not as bad as it sounds if you can find a good lawyer, but I think it's pretty bad if you do it yourself. Like, mm. hard to navigate. Like, you know, when you when you file a trademark, apparently you, you get a, like a bunch of scam letters sent to your house, where whatever address you have on file, and like they try to ask for money, but they're all fake. Mm. Um, what? Really? Yeah, yeah. Because like most, because it's. I guess, you know, if you do it through a lawyer, they tell you, you know, just ignore this. It's all, like, bullshit. But if you do it by yourself, you know, maybe you get freaked out because they look really official. Wow. That's just one fun, fun business thing. <laughs> business. All right. Uh, wow, that's just harrowing to know. Yeah. So, considering you both do write to a fair degree, I was actually going to ask how the writing process in the games work between you both and yeah if you'd care to mention anodyne too a bit there then yeah it has been i think part of why i've been doing most of the writing is well part of it is that that's how it worked out for our first game and so we just kind of like got into a mode and then also i think like it sort of works well when sean is like doing initial coding to like test certain stuff out and like make a bit of a structure. It's like a good time sort of where I can't really be doing a lot of other stuff besides like thinking about the story. Oh, that's um, a good point. And so, yeah, I don't know. It feels like it kind of has just happened that way. Though like I could see it going other ways. I don't know. I do have a lot, I have like a lot of opinions though, like about narrative structure. And so, I don't know. Yeah, I think it's easiest uh, for just one person to take the lead in a collaboration. Like, I could... Mm, I don't... Yeah, I think the pre-production phase of development, it makes it too... It's too hard to, like, juggle writing and coding and stuff like that. I mean, I, I, mean, I have, like, you know, vague ideas and can contribute, but, like, when it comes to, like, you know, hashing out the first draft of a main story or something, that's, like, hard to do when you're trying to, like, code all this like stuff and manage all the other things but you know in the future you know things can change if you have more people hired but uh in the future maybe it'll change but i don't really i don't really mind the way things are divided um because it works pretty well this sort of just slightly switching gears but game development requires people to wear a lot of hats to practice and refine a lot of skills so where and how did you folks develop them and what specific skills has it required from you? I think coding, I had the most skill when I started. Obviously the business, well, oh yeah. Had, you had like, you had music lessons and had done some composition. Yeah, yeah. I've been composing for like a year and a half. Well, like my entire life basically, but um, a year and a half focused. So I had a lot of, I had a lot of music going into Anodyne. A coding and then like not a lot of game design really but like enough to like fake it you know and, and <laughs> um yeah I, I i i get this sense that like you can be very very good at game design but if you are able to make other things pretty consistent you don't actually have to be that strong to kind of like people to think a game is good i don't know <laughs> maybe i'm wrong but i you know 
Anodyne was like the first time I was designing designing level levels, and I'm not very like good at level design, um, but people liked it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Anodyne had pretty good level design. It also had really interesting, weird, like experimental puzzles in like the post game. Yeah, that were so they made sense in a very gamey, programmy sense. Like you wouldn't come across them in a game that isn't anodyne, basically. Right. The the tile stuff that was tile swapping puzzles, doom. Yeah. Yeah, I don't even know where that. Came. I'm trying to. <laughs> oh, I I think that was metaf. Well, we can talk about that too later, but um, I'll keep, I'll keep that in mind. But um, Marina, want to mention anything about the uh... skills developing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. Yeah, I so I had been doing like hobbyist pixel art. That was like kind of what I would mainly do when I would try to like make games as a kid. I never really finished anything, so I'd just be like, oh, like I'm gonna like I have this idea for a game, I'm gonna like make a character sprite and some and a tile set and sort of imagine what this game could be and then like not really ever be able to like figure out the writing or the design and so I just kind of did that throughout my childhood is like making tile sets and making character art and then just more broadly like drawing and taking art classes I was like an art major in college and as far as writing I always had a really hard time writing and I I guess most of my experience was from comics I guess I did did comics growing up and then I got more into that in college with there was this um group at my college called Carlton Graphic and uh being part of that and we kind of like encouraged each other and we had these publications that we would put out every few weeks and so that that I got some practice writing for those and I would do certain oftentimes like a small one page thing and they would have some humor that was kind of similar to anodyne uh of these like strange one-off characters and so that there's kind of echoes of that there and so i think the structure of anodyne's writing really worked out for me because it was i didn't really have to create a convincing sort of real world or alternate reality it was more just like throwing a lot of weird ideas at the wall and just kind of seeing what stuck i oh like so i do right now but i didn't like during anodyne really i was kind of just developed on the side and through like for anodyne even the ocean i did a few like npcs and stuff i read the secret ocean stuff oh yeah good <laughs> Oh, nice. Oh, yeah, I was I was playing through that yesterday because I was reading the interview questions, just thinking about it. But uh, yeah, so I, I've I've just been practicing on the side with like short like fiction stuff, like novels, um, all our Asia's. Uh, it's something I still want to get better at. Yeah, you know, whenever I have time, I guess because it's an interesting like skill. I think it's a really important skill for games because it's easy to kind of just it's easy to kind of just do it and not put too much thought into it i guess and it'll be fine but like you know i think uh reading a lot of stuff and practicing writing a lot can really help with conveying whatever you want to convey or just giving a very unique tone to the game uh, yeah and it's very efficient to to just like if you can just like write something that's good or interesting then that like all it is is just some text and that's like you don't have to like do a lot of stuff that takes a lot of hours or whatever in yeah. terms of like creating assets for some scene or something if you can just like write really if you can just write something good i mean plus good conversation piece for when people step away from the game yeah if they feel the need to gush about story points what was like hardest for you guys well folks as the skill to refine hmm mm. I, for me, I think, I think like level design and game design, uh, maybe like level design. I don't really like like it. 
or I'm like bad at brainstorming. Like, I don't know what it is, but it's it's like for me, it's kind of similar to writing, but harder. Like, I don't. I guess I don't mind doing it, and I can do it okay. But it's also just like, you know, it's something that seems like some people just really, really enjoy, like naturally or something. Like making levels of tiles or stuff, and I kind of like it in 3D, but like uh, making like little puzzles or like combat layout mechanics is kind of fun, but also like I have this weird mental block that has never really gone away, but it's just something you have to do, so I do it. <laughs> yeah. I don't have good memories of level design, so. Level design, it can be really fun sometimes. I do, I liked working on it for, yeah, I actually kind of like level design. It, it was, I feel like it's been going pretty well for Anodyne 2. I actually really like doing the level design and something about having these little like tiny square screens for the 2D areas. It's very like satisfying to kind of like set up the idea of a little puzzle um, and it's kind of limits your options a little. Even the ocean got a little complicated because it's it's very unique and the energy shifting, the way your movement works, led to sort of like... Breaks here and there. Well, just you have to like test it a lot or I don't know, just like try things over and over and over again. And I think certain aspects of even the ocean in like a lot of ways got really overthinky, which is maybe just like a, a second game, like a sophomore effort kind of problem. Um, and also had to do with like where my mind was at the time, but just in terms of like the writing and the politics and the game design and the art, like everything seemed to kind of get a little overthinky and a little stuck. I would agree that applied to the music stuff. And yeah, I, I was thinking about even the ocean all night and like a lot of what we kind of end up settling on felt, I guess it was very response to anodyne. Yeah. In terms of viewing it's a lot so a lot of stuff in Anodyne is having certain issues and then moving away from that. But um I don't know. What we ended up with was pretty good. Um but I was thinking about how the like the post game of Even the Ocean is kind of like a it's like an alternate timeline that is not a very good game, but you know, I guess the way we could have finished Even the Ocean could have diverged into a different way. And that's just interesting to think about. Yeah, yeah. I I think um yeah, I was definitely like thinking and overthinking a lot about like imagining all the like all the things that people would say or all the things that people would criticize. I guess it's like when you release your first game and you just like hear a lot of different reactions, then you have so much sort of feedback or like the idea of feedback that you might get in your head that it's easy to try to to want to try to like please everyone. And that's impossible. So like something that I tweeted like a while ago in working on Anodyne 2 was that like for any kind of like game development, you have to like an integral part of the process is imagining like a, a player. You like make up a player in your head and you picture them going through what you're creating and like what are they going to think when they see this? What is that going to communicate to them? And I think a lot of the time it's easy to fall into and I definitely did fall into during even the ocean is imagining a player who like really doesn't like your game and who doesn't want to be playing it and would rather be doing something else and trying to like design for them in some way where you're like no like it's okay like trying to like fix everything so that this person this imaginary person will play your game I think in a certain sense though by separating it to the story and the gauntlet mode and the normal mode mm -hmm. that was sort of achieved because at least for someone who might be averse to like a really narrative heavy platformer which in essence even the ocean was like they mm -hmm. still had this relatively hey look platformer fun like physics manipulation by running into danger go to it yeah yeah, and I think, yeah, there's definitely like good things that you can, that can be achieved by having that thought process. But it's just like, it, it's probably better, in my opinion, to maybe 
just like check in on that imaginary player who doesn't like your game as much but like for the most part not just like let them be the guiding force of everything because at the end of the day the people who are actually going to play your game and are going to be like the people who want to play it because <laughs> the point. other people will just stop or not buy it in the first place. And you, you're able to kind of go further in more distinctive directions if you'll just like let yourself be a distinct thing that can't please everyone. Also just sounds like a healthier headspace to be in. Yeah, it just feels better. It feels less awful. <laughs> yeah, then you're just worried about fin- not about <laughs> pleasing pleasing uh gamer x 69 whatever someone <laughs> gamer x shadow 779 yeah i definitely get this um sense so some fan comments on amazon 2 are fan questions i get the sense that uh, people are i mean people are imagining certain things and that's fine and it's normal and it's also based on because we have these marketing assets that you know they lead you to imagine the game in some way but i'm also like not worried about pleasing these fans like you know there's been like questions about you know oh is it going to be similar to time um not really and that kind of stuff or like you know how does the story or whatever there's a lot of stuff about like oh is there going to be something as cool as a swap and i know i'm trying not to worry too much about those kinds of like expectations and because these people are going to like you know they're fans right and um they're going to appreciate seeing anything interesting, I guess. I'll address a bit more on the Anodyne too, because I have my own questions about it, especially because it's a sequel and there's like yeah. certain expectations set generally by something being a sequel to its prior work. And I like looked at Anodyne too and was like, I wonder how this is going to translate into it, if at all. But yeah, yeah, yeah. before we go down that rabbit hole, I had a few more questions. Yeah. Sure. First one. What, what's the origin of the studio name? It's like Analgesic? Analgesic. Yeah, Analgesic, I think, is... Yeah. Um, okay. So it's I don't know, it's pretty straightforward. Um, uh, it's based on anodyne. And Analgesic is like a painkilling drug. That's like, like a categorical <laughs> name for that. Kind of like old-timey, I think, name for that. And then anodyne is also... It has like a different nuance to its meaning, but it's basically the same thing. <laughs> yeah, we needed to we needed to open business to get money from Steam, so we were just like we just picked a name. Um, I think <laughs> it has it, a. It, it sounds like official. It just like I just like <laughs> thought of it, and I was like, yeah, that sounds like a company. Adult yeah, music Productions. It sounds like a pharmaceuticals company, but it's okay. We won't get sued <laughs> because. Um, even if we misinterpret the company, we're in a different like market. So yeah, plus it's too late now. Um, I mean, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a it's a pretty nice name. I mean, I get it depends how you interpret it. I I don't want. I mean, I don't think anyone thinks too hard about game studio names because if you think about any game studio name, they're all like, unless it's like you know Kojima Productions. Like all the names are kind of goofy in some way, like Bungie, like Square, like Square. Um, so that analgesic's just our choice, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I just, you know, some of them have neat or weird names behind them. I'm like, must know little tidbits. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah, you it's can funny. interpret it. It's funny that you can um, shorten it to anal prod. Yeah. <laughs> I was not going to mention I did that. No. <laughs> but That's I did okay. have that put there's notes at one point. And I was like, never mind, putting you back to full size. <laughs> not no, sending fine. you guys an email with that in there you know <laughs> yeah that's our uh analgesic prod is our um <laughs> twitter handle because it doesn't fit productions yeah but i guess there's some interpretation of analgesic that is actually kind of nice one of them though one interpretation is like oh we make uh escapist drugs which is um not as nice but you know it doesn't really matter it's a company name so it's not inaccurate though considering yeah. how pivotal gaming is in escapism and yes escapism in itself is not necessarily done bad if done yeah, in moderation yeah. so you make affordable escapism drugs that don't have as many lasting repercussions as the alternatives positive, yes. positive. <laughs> that is true what what were you there was sounded like there was a second half to what you were saying though sean 
uh, interpretation of energy. Oh, um, I can't remember. I, I can't think of it right now. But uh, I, I mean, I guess what I would say related to that is that's that's also kind of related to the title of anodyne because they're the same. They're kind of syn uh, synonyms, and um, because anodyne is both a game. And you can play it and be like, oh, yeah, like I'm engaging in this media and it's it could be a fun or it could be like a break from your life or whatever. But then it's also simultaneously like trying to like work through like concepts of escapism and the role that games or media play into our life and hopefully like work through things in a way where it is simultaneously something that could be considered escapism while also maybe giving some cool perspective that that helps you when you go back to your life outside of it yeah oh i remember now so i guess it's like analgesic helps with pain and and in some way you could, maybe if it fixes the pain through the experience you have that's kind of an interpretation although mostly i don't think too hard about the company name <laughs> yeah at least we didn't pick something like that we would totally get sued over, like Boss Fight Studios. Is that a studio? It probably is. Well, there's the Boss Fight books. Oh, yeah. Okay. Isn't there also the Boss Fight card game? Uh, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. probably. Um, or is it Boss but anyway, Monster? Yeah. But yeah. Oh, Boss Monster, yeah. How many fun game dev stories? Either while making a game, while attending conventions, or just doing game devery related things. Just fun stories from just being a game dev, more or less. Uh, I like read I like reading reviews when they're <laughs> well thought out. Like um that's a fun story. Yeah. I'll... <laughs> oh god. It's also I mean, the more you release games, the more you start to view Negative reviews is kind of like funny um, when they don't have any good criticisms. Oh boy! But I like—I don't know—it's reading criticism is always surprising. Like all our Asia's got mentioned in like Village Voice at the end of a Annihilation movie review <laughs> as like a better alternative to the movie. I was like, oh, nice. Um, <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Fun um, stories. You could watch this movie, or you could just play this game, which does it better. Yeah, address certain ideas. I yeah. guess it was. They're not saying it was better, but like, there's. Anyways, yeah, it was like contrast or something. What is fun? Let's meeting see. people is fun. Yeah, meeting people is fun. The, these aren't really good stories, though. We're just saying like, what's fun about? I mean, that's that's fine, honestly, because I'm still yeah. hung up over. And hey, it won't cost you the cost of like movie theater popcorn to go and play. Oh, I have a really goofy story from GDC twenty thirteen. Go for it, go for it. My first GDC, I had a game developer friend, Kelvin French, who released the Real Texas interesting 3D game, and he invited me to, um, Notch, ha Notch used to have a giant GDC party every year at GDC, the Minecraft guy who, like, uh, sometimes has questionable things. Um, he had this GDC party, and Kelvin invited me, because you get, like, a plus one, so I went, and there's, like, Skrillexes there. Now, this isn't something that I really, like, enjoyed or would want to go to again but it was just a really weird it was just a weird story and i could go because i had just turned 21 and i remember some other game developers got had a, couldn't go in because they were only like 19 or 20 um which sucked but um they're doing really well now so it's it's okay i guess in the end <laughs> not that this party mattered at all it was just it was kind of just a waste of time but um it was goofy yeah, I mean, it's just the game industry is weird in general. It's very weird, like, being at events like GDC, and there's just, like, completely different worlds colliding, and it's so strange to be like, oh, I guess we are in some way a part of the same industry, myself and some, like, <laughs> giant company thingy. But yeah. actually, we're not. We're, like, doing completely separate things, but also we're, like, competing for for attention and that's the most bizarre thing i don't know it's just very strange yeah cause there's just like business I and mean, there's like people and you can learn stuff from like big business people but at the same time it's like you know their goals have i mean outside of maybe making enough money to live their goals have literally nothing to do with our goals there's kind of like a i don't know they're just like let's make something 
that'll be very big and fun. Um, which is, and that's it. And they don't think about much more of that and get a lot of money. <laughs> Whereas, you know, you have studios like, like Aether Interactive trying to make, like making some of the most interesting narrative games and they have trouble like breaking even. I don't know. It's a lot of weirdness. The difference of priorities. Yeah, the difference of priorities, who gets funding, who doesn't. Like luck, luck plays a pretty big role in a lot of things. Like you have a lot of these um, gigantic Kickstarters that launch people's careers, but then they like burn out and don't make anything for a long time and it sucks. And I'm like, uh, Alternatively, great projects that have a bunch of stuff for it or semi close and the Kickstarter does not pass. Yeah, exactly. That too. You know, it doesn't like take off. I mean, it's a business industry. That's just what happens, but it's also messed up and I wish it could change. Yeah. Just we live in a strange world, probably. Yeah. I mean, games are definitely not the strangest thing. Yeah. <laughs> they are strange. But... They're pretty weird, though. I feel like when Sean and I are together, we often take some funny pictures at game events. Like yeah. there's that and there's that Andoin one from Indiecade oh, yeah. where there were like rearrangeable letters on the wall and we spelled Andoin. Yeah. <laughs> Looks very tired and cold. <laughs> and wow. then there was that um PlayStation party that had a flipbook machine. Oh yeah. <laughs> that was awesome. Um, Sean had this sign that said having too much fun. I have that somewhere. I think it's in a box in my room. Um, and then yeah. there's that one where I have like whole cans. Oh yeah, yeah, there's a humble. So humble bundle used to be a lot smaller and indie focused. Oh, I recall. Um, I recall. And yeah, and they used to invite you to parties at GDC. I mean, maybe they still do this, but the parties are really big, and they had a, like a weird photo booth of like Hulk hands, and we took a photo there and like left basically. <laughs> I don't think we stayed very long, right? No, not particularly. Yeah, Humble used to be really um, like it was interesting because I used to I used to get coffee of one of the guys there, but then he like left and you know kind of lost contact. So, but I'm probably going to try going to GDC next year. Just I think you have to for business stuff because mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of doing well. I mean, it's a lot of doing well is just like making friends at the various big companies, um, which is. You know, kind of fun to do, maybe a little utilitarian, but I spe- like the stores are so big that it's really hard to do well without having someone who can kind of like, you know, mention you and stuff. So, yeah, that's, that's a digression, but um, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's business, business stuff. Yeah. Okay, to redirect a little bit then, uh, uh, but still sort of stay topical, game development's a fairly stressful practice. Most developers i have talked to have have agreed on this point do you, you have any tips or specific practices that you folks do to help manage that stress walk outside meet with friends who are not in games that's my two main tips and have a like a side hobby or gig like i teach which is also stressful but it also takes away stress from game development it's a different stress yeah 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 i think it's 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 really nice to have friends who like don't care at all about game development um because it just puts everything in perspective and yeah walking outside is good i don't do it as much as i should i'm pretty like bad in certain ways at managing stress but also we're in i feel like we're in a pretty good position relative to a lot of smaller developers yeah Um, like we have we both have health insurance and we have enough money for at least another two years of development and we're not going to need all two years. So nice financial planning. I like doing that. <laughs> I don't like doing financial planning. See, so yeah, I got that on me. Yeah. Uh, I, Oh, I got a good thing is just like setting work hours. So I don't work on Mondays or Sundays usually. And that helps to have a break. I don't think I took breaks as much during even the ocean, but it really does. It's, I guess it's counterintuitive at first, but it does really make you more productive. Yeah, no, it, I've been told that you're supposed to set work days and break days and not work on not work days, and I'll learn that lesson one day. One day. Like, I'm pretty sure we're going to finish the game. Um, we're not close, but, like... 
I mean, yeah. we're basically uh, unquestionably going to like. Yeah. I don't know. I basically felt like we were. I I was never really worried that we weren't going to finish even the ocean. I don't know why. I guess I mean just because like anodyne. I don't, I don't know. We just have like a working relationship that just seems very functional, even when things are hard. Yeah. But Anodyne 2 is going way smoother than that. And we're much more quickly getting to the point of like, oh, yeah, this is the art style. This is the writing style. We're like finishing things. Yeah. Like it took it took like a year and a half to like figure out the art style of even the ocean. Wow. Yeah. Even the ocean. Yeah. I, don't see. I, don't I have see. one last sort of question specifically directed at you folks before we dive into the even the ocean questions and then the okay. Anodyne in general questions but um so any hobbies you guys just you you folks rather engage in when working on game development when not working on yeah not non non gamey hobbies i like cooking oh yeah Cook you like lot. doing food reviews oh yeah. it's like a <laughs> it's a secret review a secret um hobby i have a yelp account which i'm it's kind of like a dark history but i'm still doing it anyways <laughs> Uh, I like how you had like a game game packs account and did game packs reviews. Oh yeah, as a kid. Yeah. My hobby recently, I've been getting into acrylic painting, and that's been fun and healthy. I think I like reading. Sometimes I like get out of it, sort of, but reading books is nice. Um, and comics. Oh yeah, I like to read books now and yeah. then. Oh, films. We both have movie movie accounts now. Yeah, I've watched a few movies so um, far. They they. I feel like the the more the less like predictable a movie is, the more like energy it takes to stick with it. Oh yeah, you gotta like focus. Yeah, you have to like pay attention because it's not just gonna like play out however you expect. No. Yeah. But yeah, I I do like movies and watching shows. Um. I really I watched The Good Place recently, and I loved that show. I have not actually watched television properly in ages. Mm, me too. Sometimes anime, but rarely. Yeah, yeah, that and I like I watched a movie recently with my fiance. She introduced me to Crimson Peak, which I'd never seen, and was mm. actually yeah, super I great. That. I actually oh, really liked it. Yeah, I really like Guillermo del Toro. Crimson Peak was not like one of my favorite of his, but it was pretty cool. There was some good subversions of dramatic tropes, like yeah. There, there was like the whole Chekhov's gun setup thing they had going there near the very, very end, and it just didn't happen. I was like, "Hmm, look, it looks like a whole dangerous work setup, and and you know, moving parts, machinery. I bet someone's gonna get tangled. Nope, nope, <laughs> nope. Shovel knighted, but no tangle. And okay, it's fine. Shovel knighted." <laughs> It's the most, if you haven't seen it, it's the most accurate thing I can say without, like, spoiling it. <laughs> and it's still slightly spoilery. Hmm, I see. <laughs> um, I like learning language. Learning language. Well, I, uh, I guess yeah. It blows my mind that Sean just, like, learns languages while we're making games. <laughs> like I polyglot things? No, no, not polyglot. I mean, like, I, I've been learning, like, Japanese on and off slowly the past four or five years and i can speak it okay now and read it pretty well um but i'm shifting more to chinese because that seems more about uh where i might end up living and my relatives like i have some japanese relatives but um chinese is definitely just more important japanese is good for games but i don't think i'm going to be living there like for years whereas i might be living in taiwan so if that's sums up this part then i suppose i will officially kick things off for even the ocean so to start off whilst most people who watch this are going to be familiar with even the ocean or anodyne would you care to just give a quick short cliff note of the game are are we getting into it seems like this interview is getting into spoilers should we like cliff oh, notes? all right there, there, and... there's going to be some spoilers in these questions. FYI, if you haven't actually played even the ocean, bear in mind we're probably going to spoil details of the story. I'm sorry, sort of. Please go and buy it now. 
the 40,000 wishlisters. <laughs> I wish you would all buy the game. <laughs> <laughs> Your discretion is advised for everyone who murders other people over the internet for spoilers. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Cliff notes away. I mean, you can keep the story part pretty vague. The yeah. So even the ocean is a, It's a story of this power plant mechanic named Aleph. It's her first day on the job, and she works for the big central city of White Forge City. And her job at first is to repair these power plants by going in there. But um, there's, a, there's a disaster on her first day of work for multiple reasons. She is now tasked with fixing all these remote power plants on her own. And that actually ends up revealing kind of this world-threatening presence or, like, phenomenon. And she must deal with that while kind of dealing with all the power that she's being given by the city. So she starts out with not a lot of responsibility, but by the end of the game has a lot of responsibility. That's kind of the gist of it. And you go to more and more strange places as the game progresses. I, I did not cough and say Mako Energy. Wait, shit, there we go. Mako Energy. <laughs> uh, that that was a brief, brief in-joke. Because I, like, I stream a lot of the games that I end up interviewing or, like, doing little things for. Mm-hmm. And... Which is where actually a couple of these questions are going to be coming from. It's not just me. It's also like my community sort of weighing in on it. Yeah. So what led to the creation of Even the Ocean? We Oh, it was basically, I think, an observation Marina had about Anodyne. If you just put enemies into an empty screen, it became interesting. So we kind of thought, what are some ways that we can do that, but make it nonviolent? And that kind of led to the shield mechanic and platforming okay i'll admit i was like god damn it let me be goofy and just beat things to death with a shield please a couple <laughs> times because so i was like can i captain america something yet no no oh yeah no <laughs> can i shield bash no yeah we we were very like we had a sort of i don't know it felt almost uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not like monastic, but like this sort of like really like dedicated thing where we wanted to be, we only wanted to be fun and really like, like they had to be an interesting way. And I think we're like easing off of that in Anodyne too. Yeah. And just like doing kind of whatever works and allowing ourselves to use a broader space of design rather than feeling like, oh, it has to be this, like, ideal, nonviolent or whatever thing. Yeah. And we're pretty strict about certain kind of, like, core concepts and rules of how even the ocean plays. I was just really sad, because I was like, <laughs> man, you, you, some of these things are such jerks. I just, I have a giant hunk of metal on my back. Please let me, no, fine, yeah. fine, I'll play the game properly and be a good little power plant worker. <laughs> yeah. So what inspired its story? I think it was after, as Sean said, we had this idea of the shield. Um, we also kind of were going back to this idea of initially in Anodyne, Sean didn't want to have um, health. And oh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I was reading that the other day. We were like, for the purpose of Anodyne, we're like, ah, it just kind of like works better. It creates more drama and more sort of sense of progression and ups and downs if there's health. But we kind of went back to that idea again of like, does there need to be health? If it's not violent, then like, why does it matter if you're getting like worn down by being hurt by stuff or whatever? And we don't really like a lot of instant death things. And so... That kind of led to this idea of like the two directional energy bar where it's like, sure, you have to be careful in situations, but not in the sense that you have to just like be so good that you don't lose a certain amount of health over this like long stretch of time. Careful, you um, say. You probably wouldn't have wanted to watch me play. <laughs> I was like jumping head first and to be like gotta go fast gotta gotta get shot full of purple energy and all purple away. I love purple <laughs> yeah I mean well that's the thing too is that you can do that and that's like an interesting thing that the two directional energy allows 
once we had the ideas of the shield and nonviolence and two directional energies, then that kind of like laid out the themes of the game. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I can't remember the order, but at some point in the early months, the game, so you know, uh, the game started as two games. One of them was a more like slice of life adventure thing, and then you would enter these dream worlds, um, which were more abstract and had platforming challenges. And at some point, it like transformed into like an abstract like adventure, like the post game of Even the Ocean, where you would like have to fix these power plants for like no good reason and like activate trains or something. <laughs> and I think um, somehow with that and the mechanics, uh, Marina came up with the main story. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I think like based on the like vague ideas we 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 were thinking, yeah, the like two part structure was kind of um, the we were going to have one part that was like even and it was like a real life sort of character slice of life character, and then the ocean, which was like abstract, like anodyne, which I think you just said. But as we were developing the the part that we were thinking of as more like anodyne, what happened was that like it just started coming up with the story and characters in that. And it ended up too whole and not abstract enough to balance well with this like slice of life other half. Hmm. And so it kind of just like absorbed into one more more like world built fantasy world story. Yeah. That's the gist of it. Just gonna touch on another aspect of inspiration or the like, but what was it that served as the aesthetic inspiration for the game, if anything? Some things we were thinking about were, I think I was kind of thinking about uh, Final Fantasy IX and like Ghibli films. And then aesthetically, was I looking at? I think like at first I at first the it was going to be pixel art and i can't really remember what i was <laughs> what i was trying to make it like i think i i idealized this sense of using the tiles in a more like texture based way and just like creating lots of different interesting textures and then like building shaped spaces out of them but it i don't know it ended up not really working out the way that i wanted to I'm not exactly sure why it might have worked actually if we did what we're doing now and had smaller tile size interestingly hmm. but then it pivoted and i guess it ended up i uh learned a lot about like painting from there's this guy on who has like a school and does these youtube videos uh, it's like Feng Zhu design, and he does a lot of um, concept painting, and so I watched a bunch of his videos, so that was probably like something. And then also like broadly, the aesthetic inspiration is often like related to like places like nature or hikes that I've been on or like trying to recapture the feeling of like being outside in interesting places. So you've already sort of, I feel like you both have already sort of touched on this slightly, but what was the hardest challenge for making the game? I mean, a lot of, a lot of things. It was very hard. It's like, it's, I'm still in this zone where it's hard for me to not be like pretty down on Even the Ocean. I guess because, not because I, th I don't think it's good. Like, I think it's pretty good, but because... I feel like there's this disconnect between like what it is and what I was like trying to make and what I was thinking it was as I was working on it, maybe. The ideal yeah. versus the reality. Yeah. And all these ways in which I was like trying to like preempt criticism or make something like better than something easier. Uh, like I had, I had all these ideas and it seemed to like justify how difficult the development process was. And then like, I don't know, it just kind of like is a thing and everything just like has its sort of like pros and cons and ups and downs. I think um, 
Well, for one, we didn't have very good tools. I had to build an editor. I think we really should have used Unity for this kind of scale because it was just really kind of janky to navigate. And like, I would have to spend days on building some like function because the workflow was too slow for something. Um, I think more I think about it, I think another reason was just there wasn't much good financial sense. I, I didn't have a very good like financial sense for how to deal with things. I think we were too, at least I was too comfortable with the money Anodyne made. And so the mindset that I had was always, oh, you know, it can take as long as it needs to take um, and we'll be fine. Whereas I think if we had, I think if we had hired like a producer or something, maybe we would have had more pressure to have like figured things out faster or like scale things down. But I guess that wasn't a hard part of development. It was just me reflecting on even the ocean. But yeah, the hardest is probably the programming. There's just so many moving parts and like stuff to manage and test. Uh, I had very good, very good memories of as soon as the game ended and it locked the like times three movement thing, just finding out how many things I could break. Yeah. Answer a whole lot of things finally, because I guess you'd fine tuned it very specifically. So it's incredibly hard to do so during the main game but once you gave me like times nine jump height or like movement <laughs> speed i was just like i got this Whoom, off the screen <laughs> like oh you take damage if you fly too high up yeah, yeah. i know the thing was just like the oof, programming a lot of those entities was pain in the ass because like yeah, it was more or less our own platforming engine with some stuff the engine handled and just Stuff yeah. would break for so many reasons. There's really still a lot hard. of glitchy stuff. And it was like really hard because I feel like, yeah, it was like hard getting like entities to like interact with each other in predictable ways. And so it was hard to like build up complexity of ideas. Yeah. In in the main game, I never really encountered anything that was like overly jarring other than there was like, I think one thing was like persnickety once. And it was only really when it got to like, you know, cue ridiculous levels of speed or jump height that I was actually able to do anything that really messed with the game. And you guys thought of, oh yeah, there's going to be players going to be dumb enough to jump out of bounds somehow and gave the warp back to like the the map ability. Thank oh, you. the post game. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Also, the story was really hard. It, I, I don't. I don't feel like I'm, I'm not like, um, I don't like pay attention to like really well to like regular life stuff in the way that, I don't know, someone who would be really good at like world building is, I think. I'm more sort of like interested in like weird fringes of ideas and emotional underpinnings of things. And so trying to create like this entire world and like feeling the pressure of it like sort of making sense as a society and as a as a world like that was like a lot of pressure that i didn't really feel like i could stand up to it was very hard for me to resist doing my mayor voice for a second <laughs> hey, oh no it was hello Aleph. <laughs> just like very cheesy salesman yeah yeah, because he always had that uncanny sort of like trying to sell himself to the people he was talking to aspect to him. Yeah, but yeah. So originally, like this was meant to be two games, as was spoken and as was mentioned earlier, and uh, like that's duly apparent when you see the secret ocean at the end of the game. Uh, is there anything specifically mechanically? that didn't make it into the final game that you really wanted to include in there? Not... Uh, I can't remember anything. No. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, like, there were... I feel like there were various, like, entities here and there that ended up not working out. I think, um, I think what we tried to do at one point, but it was just too complicated and, like, to sort of like weird and difficult because like there's no combat was we wanted to have more like enemy like things or like creatures that would sort of have AI or move around and react to you 
and we did a little bit and there's this like concept of the like gm spores yeah um that get more common as you progress through the game biological but centuries even those are like pretty mechanical and like just like really tied to the exact like design ideas and not really feeling like creatures that you're like engaging with and so i think that's something that it would have been a really hard design problem because if there's like something annoying you but you can't like fight it and i don't know it's just like really complicated to like get it to not feel bad um and also just like ai is more complicated and so that's something that i think would have made the game kind of expand more and be a little less stiff as it like progressed but was just too hard i would have also even without being able to kill them directly i think it would have led to player frustration of them trying to find a way to kill it like say luring them into beams of the opposite energy to kill them dead yeah uh, which i think would have clashed with your whole thing of having this very pacifist -y sort of themed game yeah yeah the closest thing is you can bump those ones that chase you into little holes and then they get stuck <laughs> yeah but that's far different from the other uh yeah. yeah ultimately it makes sense the way it is i think we could have just um compressed maybe some of the dungeons so this is a related question but more for a literary event was was the game always intended to end on the note that it did that being the sort of apocalyptic note or was that something that was decided later on and was there specific narrative trails that you wanted to expand on but didn't have the time or the inspiration i, th I think it was always our uh, i guess marina could speak more but it felt like the games had to keep having bigger stakes. And we also had this like cyclic theme to the game's world. And that seemed like the best way to tie it up. Um, because it was also speaking to that theme of like societal inaction. Um, and it just kind of made the most sense, even though it was a little bit grim. Yeah, I mean, I think I can't remember like when that was decided on, but there there's yeah there's this kind of like backstory that i i don't really i'm unclear on whether it's canon at this point but this like structural idea we had that the world is sort of like part of this like staircase world and that on one end you have the like waterfall and that's like going up to the next step and on the other end you have the cliff and that's like going down to the next step and the idea is kind of that there's like wetness and dryness alternating and like shifting down the staircase. I didn't actually realize it was a staircase. I just thought it was like, there is a weird, mysterious, like disc world sort of, there's an edge of the world. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, we don't really go into the concept of it being a staircase and it's unclear whether that's even canon, but that was like the idea that we had kind of. I, I am glad I I was right, though, that there was, like, a distinct edge of the world. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I guess the reason that it has to end badly is because, like, I, I, I think in terms of my, like, political understanding and my, like, worldview at the time, was I was, like, trying to sort of, like, understand a lot of things and, like, figure out what was going on in the world and like a lot of like bad stuff happened in the world or at least became really evident in the world uh, as we we're working on even the ocean and so i think i was feeling like pretty down about a lot of things in terms of being aware of all these bad things but not really having like a level of like political understanding to have a lot of direction for where to go a wee bit pessimistic about our odds yeah and so it was like it was it was not really possible for me to write a situation where you i don't know distinctly make things better it's more a game about coming to political awareness ultimately and to the extent that there is hope it's the hope that outside of the story through that political awareness perhaps we can move on to knowing where to go from here yeah, it's a very um, 
2016 game, I guess. There's a lot of people who are well off. I, I mean, things have been happening, but a lot of events in 2014 kind of sparked a lot of, um, I guess, political awareness amongst people who had otherwise not thought about things that much, myself included. So it feels very fitting in that sense, in terms of the mid-2000s to 2010s. Yeah. So I'm going to start like branching a bit more into story-related questions. Uh, some of these are going to be hypotheticals or just filling out odds and ends of lore. Sure. And I'm going to kick off with a community question we have from Vita, uh, specifically wondering if the plan to float White Forge would have worked, both in the short term and the long term. Uh, <laughs> I think it would have worked in the short term, but in the long term, everyone probably would have just died. Yeah. It's not really a long-term solution at all no because yeah i think they 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 probably underestimated the extent to which the flooding is sort of like universal like they couldn't have just found somewhere else to go i actually yeah. sort of chewed them up for like if you knew it was a flood coming why didn't you just build like underwater city oh yeah guys guys really guys oh yeah <laughs> i was like god damn it you and your making effectively a tower of babel uh cries okay that's 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 the first one the next one's from my pudding who is curious to know whether there had been plans ever had been plans for solving puzzles using the mac and hypothetically how they would have worked if there were I don't think there ever were. That was yeah, always was... just the first thing in the big game. Yeah, it was. It was. It was distinctly set up to be like a tutorial, and um, and to also to like sort of. It's. It was supposed to be like a thematic thing in terms of. Yes, Aleph losing her armor. Yeah, or like yes, you aren't. You can. You can like be above the energies by having this mech and nothing affects you and you just walk through the pods and they don't change your energy level. But ultimately, that doesn't work. And the reason that uh, Aleph is the one who is able to fix the power plants as opposed to the other people who are using the mechs is that even though they aren't harmed by the energy directly while they're inside the max like Aleph is able to develop a relationship to the energy and that relationship is kind of what allows things allows Aleph to be able to navigate complex situations because yeah. they have like yeah. an a true a truer understanding and so that that's kind of um supposed to tie into like the themes of the game more broadly yeah like yeah. working with the environment as opposed to trying to subjugate it which is like a, a thematic note i noticed was very present throughout the game and you even had like the one the town which was very devoted to sort of hammering that point home don't remember mm -hmm. the boat town boat town's like all about like you know oh, working riverton. with yeah like oh, yeah. riverton very much hammers home that point of like working with your environment and there's a lot of foreshadowing towards certain points in the game which is why like i guess the big plot hook really early on and i was like god damn it what you it, the game gave me a tutorial on this what <sighs> please mm. just one of you guess this the scientist why don't you guess this surprise <laughs> oh yeah this is good questions by the way yeah yeah thank you but yeah, uh, also, just to confirm this, because uh, there'd been a slight discussion in the community as to why Elf didn't get back in the mech, and I was like, I'm pretty sure it's PTSD, because she was trapped in, like, basically a metal coffin. Yeah, that was basically it. Yeah, okay. Guys, it was PTSD, just so you know. She just couldn't go back into the giant metal coffin that she also saw her, like, co-worker die in. Yeah. Uh, I was right. Oh, uh, yeah. Very humble in victory here, yeah. <laughs> So next question for from both Axel Toss and also me because we had like a discussion about this both in the Twitch and the Discord was we're wondering if Lopez's shutdown at the end of the game was always meant to be left unresolved. Like I actually kept going back to visit her multiple times in her little secret spot in the uh -huh. hopes that 
you'd be capable of clearing the air with her one day. Like after every plant or anything, I just I kept going back to visit her. Mm. I also kept visiting uh, Alice's parents. Mm. I think it's possible she could have had more dialogue and we didn't get around to it. There, you kind of get that sense in a lot of parts of the game. But yeah, with uh, Lopez, I believe she was supposed to also be kind of like an one of like an representative of like an ideological response to like ecological disaster which is sort of like running back to the woods and hiding and so you know maybe there could have been a few more dialogues but i think her stance probably wouldn't have changed it just would have sort of resolved that it's like uh i'm resigned this is what i'm doing yeah, yeah. i mean i i agree it probably could have used a little, like maybe another dialogue or two it kind of like folds into the 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 thing we've talked about as the whole game in terms of like it's it's really like limited in terms of of like where it can go because it, there's just like yeah i didn't really know where to make it go there the, the closest hints we get to people who like actually have a direction that goes beyond just like either being ignorant or giving up <laughs> are are basically there's a uh, Dolores in Oscar Basin, the snowy town, mm. who doesn't exactly know know what's going on, but like has an intuition, and because she's like a kid and stuff, people just like discount her. She was still just like, "Oh man, this is like the best thing that ever happened to our town." Yeah, yeah, and she's like trying to do some um, I forget what it's called, but like sabotaging stuff yeah. for the greater good. <laughs> Which I mean, it doesn't quite come off it though in the in, in the interim because it also sort of comes off as like a rebellious. She doesn't like the way the town's changed, so mm -hmm. anything sort of shaking it up is sort of a good thing. Like it might be just an alternative character reading from it. Yeah, but I like came across her and I was like, "Oh, you you are so lucky. This is a nonviolent game where I would just be like pushing you around town right now." <laughs> Dang, just like. God damn it. Like, it wasn't actually the key thing that did it for me. It was the smash the elevator thing that did it for me. Mm. Where I was just like, oh, really? Really? Yeah. Which, I mean, it's also partly on the tail end of, like, at that point, you have bad things happen to, like, basically every coworker you've ever had. And that was just, like, yeah, taking all of that and being like, really? And then also taking the whole thing of like, this is potentially just, and like, no matter how it happens, I was thinking like, no one's going to be okay in this situation, like mm -hmm. whatsoever. And it's just not good. Yeah. Yeah. It is weird how it kind of like pits you against Dolores, but, but ultimately that's, that's kind of like what the game is kind of about is that the the mayor and and the scientists are 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 wrong but because they kind of like control the narrative and because there's like a failure of imagination in terms of alternatives yeah they they failed to they committed to one like a pair of responses the way the city functions and also like how they were going to deal with the problem in the other sense and then they just are committed to how that turns out and at that point it's like a well and so, yeah and so you get pitted <laughs> against the people who are like most correct <laughs> about how the world works yeah so it's kind of sad <laughs> it's kind of a it's a very melancholy game also very accurate failure of imagination underwater city when <laughs> <laughs> and then the next guys are going to be like well floating city didn't work let's do the underwater si when the drought happens and we all just face palm yeah guys guys so the other thing i was actually really curious about was i wasn't sure about this i read into it this way other people disagreed but the world seemed to imply to be bigger than just like the continent with White Forge on it. Like there was reference to sort of other people, etc. So mm -hmm. while this might be an overly depressing inquiry, I mean, the game in itself is sort of depressing. 
were there other cities, continents, islands with people on it who weren't displayed but were in the world? World building, I, no. I I mean, I guess it, it's implied that there were, but we had not like um written in the name of the city down on like a world building sheet or something. Oh no, it wasn't if they were written down. It was if they're at because I'd read into it the implication that it was like a whole other world out there, and people were like, oh, no, no, oh, it's okay. just the isolated it's the single place and i was like i i'm pretty sure there's other places i i think oh then I yeah there would be oh god i don't really th or i think that it's unlikely that there's no other continents and no other people but that the white forge civilization like the, i don't think the story really makes sense if they're aware of other people so like maybe they are but it's like back in history less technologically advanced they're probably less technologically advanced and the white forge um civilization has this kind of like arrogance and like not really caring about other stuff uh. and so maybe there are some like other people who they lost contact with back in history um but there's not because like Aleph is sort of like shocked that there's this other continent that you can just go to which, I, I mean, there's an incomplete reason for this, and that is, so if there are other people, and assuming, you know, it's a large world, there's other continents, so that means, you know, because the Tidewell affects the entire world, right? That's implied, yeah. So all these people and other continents for every iteration of the game die horribly because of the faults of people on a singular continent. Well, it's it's complicated. I would say that the... Horribly. The... <laughs> The point, <laughs> the the point of the like cyclical apocalypse idea, is that um, you're not supposed to read. I mean, it's sorry. I just it was immediately a thing I realized. I was like, oh. I think it's more the one continent isn't really to be read literally as a single, but more on a like a metaphorical level for just an oh, entire wow. coherent world. Yeah. Um. So it's. So it's yeah. yeah it's less about like other people and also it's the i think we're not really trying to communicate that white forge is the only factor in when the apocalypse apocalypse comes and so like the idea is that there's this like eternal cycle like kind of in the ways that may be true for our own for our own world of like mass extinctions and or eventual other heat death and stuff um but like the implication being that there are, there ultimately will be some time at which the flood will come regardless of anything anyone does but also that like the things that people do have effects on that and so it's it's not just that there's like a one-to-one -one thing where oh like white forge did something bad and therefore innocent people in random other continents are dying it's more just like i mean it does feel like they expedited things extremely yeah it's 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 a little ambiguous but um... and killing the geomes expedited things even faster so I, I think it was actually just even the act of harming them because the other civilization didn't even get the chance to kill the geomes so mm -hmm. they were like you know the world's antibodies trying to fight off a sickness and then they got exploded and they're like oh well better clean the sickness and then you're even more effective at killing those antibodies though it's like okay need to like purge system now yeah which I, like i feel like that was the big push for things like the apocalypse actually kicking off now with just like oh and now we're going to definitely crank everything into overdrive on making the game's world sick with the activation of white forge mm-hmm but yeah, no. That, okay, so th there might sort of be little other city settlement whatevers, but it's not like meant to be a horrible, go and contemplate how other places are victimized by the actions of the few, though that's probably fitting narratively. I mean, I feel like that's, Fine interpretation, already, but... that's already supposed to be the case in terms of like, I guess you don't really see that many people who aren't a part of settlements. Yeah, you, you, there's the... It's like because most of them that you go to have like a power plant near them, so they're party to it. I think what 
what we tried to communicate was that the actions of the most powerful people, uh, even if like there's the less power pe powerful people are a part of that society and adjacent to the the rich people, that they're victimized by it. They're victimized by it, you know. Fair. And so like it that that like kind of sad unfairness is true even of the society that we kind of see uh regardless of whether there's like other technically other people because yeah even though it's like kind of a small world the continent of white forge it is supposed to kind of stand in for uh, a like full world. the world basically okay so what the hell was hummus yeah, i kept calling him <laughs> hummus and i also would be like hello fellow who man <laughs> Whenever he was talking, because I'm like, immediately upon his arrival, I'm like, he's not human, guys. He's definitely not. And then he gave his name, and I'm like, definitely a who-man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so humus. I think actually uh, human. The word is it humus? Is related to. Yeah, so humus is, uh, is like type of like soil. Okay. Um, and human might have the same etymology as oh maybe not I I forget it's related to soil yeah I can't I can't remember if it is the same etymology or not um, yeah but the idea is that like humus soil is is like it's supposed to be a character that has a character that has a frame of reference that's bigger than just the characters in the single time in that single civilization time span. Yeah, which yeah, um, he definitely implies as much during your conversations. It, it's like outright lay like this isn't the first. And he's like, nah, this is this is fine. And like, yeah, I can pass your message on. I was, I I, I was like, is he an Arthur, a, a like author surrogate, or more like a sort of representation of the world at large, given cognizance or some combination of the two. Yeah, not really an author surrogate. I think it's more like uh, humus is like just just the idea. Humus exists to represent the fact that, like, I I think uh, it's very even with humus. Sometimes people read the game as, and it's very easy to read maybe as like this very like morality focused tale about like oh humans are evil, humans are a virus, blah blah blah, or like you know okay. consider like thinking about like oh like what do people like deserve or like what is like are people being punished and i think the character of humus exists to try to give some frame of reference that extends beyond humanness to be like okay like yeah if you like do really unhealthy stuff then um then like bad stuff can happen but but that's not like that's not like the intention of the earth as like a moral judge judging body. That's just kind of like sometimes stuff works that way. And so yeah, humus is supposed to try to take a step back from this sense of like, oh, punishment, divine retribution, and be more like it doesn't really matter to everything else if humans exist or not. It's just like it's just like this is the world you know if we care about our own existence we should like do better you know yeah i, I viewed it as sort of like not a humans are intrinsically evil but humans are intrinsically myopic because it's very difficult to see and plan ahead because like everyone is just sort of wrapped up in their own business and their own like the whole thing with lopez and the other guy who i originally really didn't like the, the the male co-worker guy whose name yeah, leads me paxton when i actually thought about it after the fact with that letter and everything i was like wait a second so and he's familiar with lopez so him running off and trying to do things on his own was that a reaction to knowing lopez and realizing that like lopez was overwhelmed and figuring like oh and like alice doing okay but I mean, Lopez ran off. Is she going to run off too? I'll just do this on my own. And that not working out well for him. <laughs> so I, it made the letter in itself and Lopez's reaction everything 
made Paxton more sympathetic. Mm. And I was like, I still don't necessarily like you as a person, but it's like slightly more understandable. Yeah, I I think Paxton is trying to kind of like represent the these like complicated sort of like identity intersections and how like Paxton is kind of like representing this like kind of like white male sort of like misogynistic guy which is why i was not necessarily a fan of him at first yeah and but also like someone who is who is like lower class and who struggles a lot because of that and how um like the people who are like most in power kind of without even having to get their hands dirty can like de facto like pit other people with various like marginalized identities against each other and so like Paxton is kind of like an unhealthy reaction to being in a bad situation of and he's being aware of it pitted, pitted against um other people and like not being able to see through that and be able to like work together with you because like both pa- I believe both Paxton and Lopez actually comment on that and are like aware of that like power imbalance there. Yeah. Cuz Paxton's like sort of grudging, suspicious but doing it anyways. Yeah, I think a lot of the characters are are me trying to grapple with like like just why why are people like bad? <laughs> why do people do stuff that like is not good? And sometimes it like over and like my mindset at the time kind of like over over goes into trying to like explain everything, trying to be like, oh, there's all these like reasons and like you can't hold anyone responsible for anything. Like, I don't know. I I really like fall into that mindset a little too easily sometimes maybe of just like the mayor is just it doesn't even have the capacity to like be a good person because he's so like ignorant and like the fact that he has so much power just like completely like inversely though inversely like when i saw the mayor and the very end it's like Uh i felt he was genuine in his want to help people but there's that very large inability to it's that whole thing of like burning the future to try and make things okay in the present like he was trying to help people and save people, but he was also very Machiavellian in that, and like, this is important to me, these ideals are important to me, the rest, but it was still like, he could have been a lot more selfish or shitty, nonetheless, like, he wasn't good by any means, like, are you a tabletop fan at all? Um, yeah, I've played a little d and I placed him as lawful evil. Like, Mm, lawful evil or possibly lawful neutral with evil tendencies. Yeah. It was just, like, that ability to just look at this and be like, I'll save what I can, but, you know, we have this way we're doing things. I'm doing it, and I'm going to buy... Because he didn't really go out of his way to make things super crappy for people, but he just did what was... Yeah. It's just, like, he can't even conceive of the fact that he can that he obviously cares more about people who are like well more, off yeah more well off and like yeah he just like he isn't even like aware enough to like do that in a malicious way it's just like so which is why we, we were like trying to figure out like is he lawful or neutral or lawful evil because these are the <laughs> nerdy questions that come up in our discord but it was like it, it was a very interesting question because there's that very he genuinely doesn't seem aware of things because he has that very big salesman facade but he never quite turns it off like the closest you see to it like falling apart is the very end when you're like going to you know do your big last final choice and he like freaks out and yeah he like the other thing there which i think i sort of voted against it is he couldn't pull the trigger on you like he he pulled Mm -hmm. the gun on you but he couldn't actually pull the trigger on you he also didn't like just do like be like oh this is really inconvenient i'm going to just send a bunch of people to arrest you he dealt with you himself mm-hmm. and that was like a really complicated 
weird. I was like, no, there, there was interesting character dynamics. And on that subject, uh, I wasn't going to touch on this immediately, but since we got onto the subject of like, just sort of character identity, like the game has a very diverse cast in a lot of ways. And like, I guess, uh, cultural gender identity is sort of like a running theme through a lot of the characters you have like mm -hmm. a representation of a lot of different backgrounds some more subtly some less subtly and i was curious about uh i guess because everything is written when you put a lot of thought into something everything is generally written for a specific reason we have literary devices we use we have themes we're trying to touch on and like you mentioned earlier with paxton like you had a very specific idea for what he was supposed to represent. You had ideas for what Lopez was supposed to represent in her arc. And I'm sort of curious, the various things you were trying to represent, as well as uh, character relationships and the things you were trying to highlight. Because mm -hmm. it had, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think, uh, <laughs> are, you, are you eating a snack, Sean? <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> om nom 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 nom. At least it's not me this time. I learned that lesson are, a long time ago. Are you ago. asking what we were trying, like, were we trying to represent particular people and why? Or... Uh, I mean... Or just it's... what the process was? Uh, our... process, what, like, you intention, mentioned Paxton idea. had a specific intention and idea, etc. Like, yeah, you made a definitely... game that's diverse, and it mm. isn't jarring in its diversity. It feels really just normal. Mm. I mean, that was definitely part of the intention. I, I think, like, whether it's jarring is certainly in the eye of the beholder, because some people are, like, pretty racist. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if a game is entirely white cast in Africa, it's a little jarring. Just yeah. gonna say. If you're, it's like, oh, and it's an entire village of white people in this village in Africa, and we're going to a different, oh, still white people, and this other village, still white people. Guys, can you maybe? I'm not asking for much here. Yeah, I mean, whether or not um, someone's like race or gender was particularly relevant like varies depending on the character and their storyline i think it was definitely something that i was thinking a lot about because both in terms of race like during that time period there was a lot of complicated and difficult stuff surrounding race coming to like the forefront of like u.s national dialogues and stuff. you mentioned this was a very 2016 game yeah and then in terms of gender as well and then personally uh i was like just coming out in i think 2013 or 14 um as trans and also like in the in the process of like developing a racial identity which still in the process of and so yeah it was so it was something that i was thinking about a lot certainly and then like oh my god like there was like gamergate and stuff but anyway yeah, so I definitely wanted to have things be... I didn't feel like I could make a lot of big statements confidently because a lot of stuff I didn't have super developed, like, ideology surrounding. But yeah, I wanted to make things have some, like, meaningful effect when sometimes and then other times just, like, to represent the basic fact that there are people who look and act in different ways in the world. And there's no reason to like ignore that. Yeah, Sarah's arc was actually really interesting just for like dealing with grief and in interpersonal relationships and like picking up that it wasn't something she was necessarily accepted for. And there was like specific hurdles she had to face because of that. It, was it Sarah? Oh, Yara? Yara, there we go. I fucking close i was close with the name. <laughs> yeah no it's all good um yeah like yara's super depressing arc <laughs> <laughs> yeah yara's like identity and various forms of marginalization allow her to have like a different perspective than Aleph. definitely like one of the one of the main things that we were trying to depict was like the concept of like the model minority that um in like U.S. context is applied to a little East Asian American 
adults who are often like less like economically disadvantaged and this idea that oh there's like certain minorities who are doing it right and therefore like the system is fair it's a meritocracy there's no racism here we go and i was sort of waiting for this was the incident with hummus also referencing that situation where in the end there's sort of the scapegoating around him i I need to stop calling him hummus but it's very hard no i mean you can call him whatever chip dip so very late game there's the whole scene where there's a confrontation in the neighborhood where like everyone gangs up and it's like you know everything just got bad when he got here he's different he yeah and it sort of ties into that because it touches on like outsiders are unknown scary different and like yes there's sort of the blatant he is distinctly not human thanks for catching on guys but it also sort of i guess ties well into that idea of what is a model acceptable outsider of what is whatever and then what is not which you also like from his introduction you also get that where people look at him immediately just go this guy's panhandling here like get him out i think there's a lot of scapegoating of hummus in that part the character of aleph as a model minority and uh, another type of minority who is being blamed i don't think the game i think the game kind of abstractly addresses those things as they relate to the u.s but at the same time they're not able to go i guess as like it's not one of the, even those stronger themes because a lot of those ideas rely a lot on either a a more realistic setting it's it's kind of hard to make those things that are kind of regional work i mean it's not just regional to, to the u.s but i mean like a lot of those kinds of examples and stories make more sense when they're actually drawing on like a real place prejudice is sort of a theme though that occurs throughout literature the fear of yeah. unknown and outsiders yeah but i mean the, in terms of the specific mechanics of model minority in terms Ah, of like america true like because like i'm canadian and it's sort of a odd concept to digest yeah because i I think some parts of the game might like you know there are themes that are common throughout literature throughout even the ocean but there's some things that might make more sense when read from an american usa perspective but even then they might still not be as clear because when it comes to referencing stuff related to like contemporary like race and settings, sometimes it's hard to do it when you're in a completely fantastical setting. Yeah, I think I think the like mechanisms behind the model minority stuff though, like they kind of happen to varying degrees in a lot of situations where someone will be like seen as an exceptional version of something that is otherwise prejudiced and then like used in weird sort of self-contradictory ways as like a yeah i don't know no i can think of on folklore stuff it does pop up where they're like ah, oh, they're they're from this nation which is normally terrible but they, they've they've helped us and then usually a story wraps up with them getting backstabbed by the people they've been being they've been helping thanks folklore thanks mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so yeah i don't know it, it's like it's i would say that even the ocean in so far as it says anything really specific about like race and gender is like pretty limited but yeah i don't know as with the entire thing it's very much like it's very much a game about like first steps and like basic awareness sort of of certain things i think this ties up all my questions for even the ocean i can't pull any offhandedly so that shifts this to both anodyne and anodyne 2 now first off before we get into anodyne 2 which last i checked you folks are working on i believe there's a thing we were talking about mechanics in anodyne 1 and you were like, I'm going to get back to that? Well, one of the major themes of Anodyne was the idea of needing to take action in order to do something about your personal problems rather than just kind of thinking about it all day. And so the swap was kind of tying into the idea that, you know, no matter how much you know, destroy and explore this 
dream world, there is not really a solution with a complete solution within it. Ultimately, you have to like leave. And so the swap kind of helps to emphasize that idea. You know, so it's, it's not just a matter of young exploring and finding the first 36 cards, you know, even though even once they get this ability to like go beyond the borders of that dream world, they're still within the dream world and, you know, can't can can't really accomplish more for themselves. Fair. That actually makes a pretty so talk about that swap mechanic and that. So you folks are currently working in Anodyne 2. I'm familiar with the initial game enough that I got to be familiar with the post-game complexities, how that tied in with the swap mechanic, and its other general sort of weirdness. I was wondering if you'd be able to just fill me in on, and the audience who's also watching this, I hope, guys, uh, as to what we might be able to expect from the sequel, both in regards to the similarities and the differences between its predecessor and what it's going to be. Oh, and if this is going to be a direct sequel, a side story, a prequel, or spiritual six you know what I mean. Getting into the specifics of what kind of sequel it is, I, I guess we can't talk about too much because it does relate to the story, but uh, right now you can kind of just think of it as a spiritual slash kind of direct sequel. It's like a mix of the two. Um, okay. Uh, we'll just leave it at that in terms of how specific I can be right now. So there are mechanicals, there are, in the terms of level to level gameplay, there are mechanical similarities. Anodyne 2 does have 2D areas that are framed like Zelda dungeons. Um, they don't use a broom as like a weapon. The kind of the main gimmick is the ability to like vacuum in objects and launch them. So still a cleaning item. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, still a cleaning item. And mm -hmm. there is a sense of, uh, you know, combat exploration there. But we're not as strictly beholden to making every single 2D area like a dungeon. Like, it does, it will be changed up a bit throughout the game. Although, you know, all the 2D sections probably do have that Zelda perspective, but it's not like, it's not kind of like even the ocean where every power plant was like a similar set of platform. Anyways, <laughs> I don't want to get too much into it, but there are there are some layers in the game, 2D aspect. The easiest way to think about it is like if you took the overworld from Anodyne, the overworld areas, and you replaced that with 3D, and then you took the dungeons in Anodyne and you replaced those with an NPC in 3D, and instead of inside of the NPC is the 2D dungeon. So it's kind of a mix of Shadow of the Colossus esque like 3D world exploration with kind of this like almost like not really exactly psychonauts but like there's a character and the characters are like the levels or the 2d levels it's shadow of the classes meets anodyne meets um psychonauts hmm. i guess <laughs> man that just leaves more questions but yeah i know <laughs> yeah i mean it's the kind of thing where uh, i feel like people had really different experiences with anodyne in terms of like what part most stuck out to them and what part sort of is the core and so uh, I feel like in some ways it's like I know kind of how what it is to me, but I feel like it's a different thing to different people. And so it's not necessarily going to feel like the same thing, but more. It's okay. definitely very different, but also I, I think in my opinion, a lot of the things that are special about Anodyne in terms of like the type of like tonal exploration of different kinds of areas and their sort of like psychic meanings and effects is going to um, exist here in a similar way. Maybe the biggest difference is that it's not a single um, a single connected 2D space. So there is a sense of leaving and entering this kind of like mental space. Okay. I was actually going to tie on to like a, a couple things here because we'd started to talk on it and then stopped earlier. But uh... How narratively dense is this compared to even the ocean and the original Anodyne comparatively? And you mentioned there was something different for, I guess, the writing in this game. It's, it's like in between in terms of size. Okay. There is a main, but maybe closer to the side of Anodyne. There's more NPC dialogue than in um, Anodyne 1, but the main story is not as writing heavy as like even the ocean. But there is a main, there is kind of like a fleshed out main story, unlike Anodyne One. Okay. It's just there are we're trying to keep the scale of the the plot smaller, um, just to finish in a more timely way, keep things uh, reasonable. 
in, like, even... in a lot of ways, the structure is actually kind of like even the ocean, but then like the structure of the central story is kind of like even the ocean. Yeah, and not in, not in terms of like themes, but just like it's it's not about like you know working for the mayor and power plants or something. But like, but just kind of how yeah, how things are kind of just set up, I guess, in terms of pacing, maybe. But it's a little bit, it's a lot looser. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we can't talk too much. I mean, I suppose like writing wise, just the general for how it's being written is that how's that being handled differently or similarly to your prior works. Yeah, I, I don't know how the writing is functioning. Basically, it's I don't know. We're just writing. It. It's my impression. Um, from of Marina's writing that. I, okay. You know, it's. I think it's trying to. It's. Mm, oh yeah, you're right. It's hard. It's hard to describe it. Okay, so I know one thing. I'm definitely trying to be more like poetic, I guess, than I was in even the ocean. Um, trying to kind of like imply more and stay sort of keep the writing more like light on its feet and um, kind of like more focused on the personal and the emotional and uh, and like creating moment or huh, yeah I don't know it's hard to describe there's like a loose there's a looseness to the writing style that's kind of like it feels it feels more it's it's not as like not traditional fantasy prose, but like it's not as like prose as even the ocean. It's a little more playful and willing to go down kind of like these energetic styles and roots without worrying. Like the, the main plot is simple enough to like follow, and there's enough there that you're not lost at the end like with Anodyne, but at the same time, a lot is still very kind of loose and allowing you to make more kind of um, interpretation sort of. So we're trying to keep it a little less like there, there's still characters, but it, it just it just feels I mean it feels more like Anodyne, right? Because it's a sequel. There's a lot more just kind of interesting NPC arcs or ideas that are there, not because and they kind of loosely fit in with some themes, but it's not like they're specifically fitting into like a particular arc that the main storyline is setting up. This is really hard to talk about. Okay, um, I'll, I'll stop haranguing yeah. you guys with story details then. Yeah, I mean with that said and done then uh other than this is there anything that you folks would like to share with the audience please look forward to uh anodyne 2 anodyne just came out on ps4 and it's coming out on xbox tomorrow so check that out if you are so interested look forward to anodyne 2 the yeah i don't know i'm trying to talk about the writing again (laughs) The writing is very stylized in a way. I feel like the styles is pretty strong. So compared to even the Ocean Anodyne, which were still strong, but, you know, stronger. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, again, you folks can buy slash wishlist even the Ocean and Anodyne on Steam. You can also see Anodyne 2 there on Steam for wishlistable purposes. For news, there's at NLJesicProd. We may have yeah. made jokes about this earlier on Twitter. Uh, plus, they have spiffy. They have a spiffy website that you can check out with links to all of the above in this video's description. And I'd just like to say a quick thank you to uh, everyone who tuned in, and also especially to you two. Thanks, thank Marina, you. for yeah, showing thanks up. Thanks for having us. And Sean. Yeah. Also, thank you for like answering all of my questions because there was a ton. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, thanks for engaging with the fiction that's cool yeah yeah is there anywhere else you'd care to send people while we're at we're at this either websites media stuff for you guys or indie projects that you guys have had your eyes on um mainly just the analgesic productions website is good a newsletter is a good way to stay up to date with us as for games in progress i don't know like play luca it just came out <laughs> um stuff in progress oh, I, I can't think of a lot right now i imagine colin's gonna be so happy about all the plugs Oh yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys. Yeah, I don't know. It's uh, it's hard for me to keep track. I it's like I'm glad when stuff comes out. Yeah. Um, my my wish list is two hundred and thirty eight odd games. Ooh. I think. Let me check. Oh, I'm excited for um, Wander Song. It's gonna be out soon. Oh yeah, soon. Oh, I heard about that. Two hundred and forty nine. Damn. Yeah. I'll 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 get to it one day. Yeah, I heard good things about Extreme Mate Punks forever. I haven't played it yet, though. Mm, yeah, I've seen a bunch of that on my Twitter feed. 
also seen Heartbeat, I think, came out on Ichigo, not on Steam. Oh, that's an RPG, right? Yeah, it had a cute cat thing, which, you know, that, I like cats, okay? Like, that was also why I was like, I shouldn't really talk about this, but I put, like, the boyfriend dungeon thing, or whatever. The thing with, like, weapons that turn into, like... Oh, yeah, boyfriend yeah. dungeon. Yeah, and then yeah. one of them was a cat, and I was just like, well, there we go. Gonna have a cat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, play, play Butterfly Soup. Right. I need to get links to that later to go and send that to, to Lovey, because she likes stuff as long as it's interesting. <laughs> yeah. it's probably something i'm not thinking of I'm go for a walk there is but oh go for a right walk, read a yeah book. um sunshine yeah, i don't one know one day cook some food engage yeah. in healthy life activities yes. yes yeah it's so hard to do but it's good yeah um, but yeah, I suppose that wraps it up then. So yeah, anyways, to those folks who uh, saw this and who lasted till the end, first off, I, I definitely appreciate the test of endurance. Second off, if you enjoyed this content, feel free to leave a comment, or if even if you didn't and you just have comments, feel free to just leave a comment. If you do want to see more interviews, hit that subscribe button and the little bell and it'll get a notice whenever we actually post up a new developer interview or just any of the other bits of indie gaming stuff that we have running. This has been Arlian and uh, the Analgesic production folks, and we'll catch you next time. Well, I will. I mean, they'll probably not be here, unless they are. Yeah. Bye. Bye.